Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yarmila Bechkali, and I am the program manager for In the Zone um, at WWF Canada, and I will be your host this afternoon. This webinar is another installment in our um, Garden for Wildlife series. And if you were able to join us last spring, you would have heard our experts give you the dirt on on native plants so that you could transform your green space into garden habitat for all kinds of species. Hopefully you're enjoying your gardens now and the lovely weather we're having this um, fall in Southern Ontario. And if not yet, well, it's never too late. Uh, you can always uh, start gardening for wildlife. As many of you know, in the zone, gardens that help native species thrive, is all about helping you create wildlife habitat in your gardens, your balconies, rooftops, patios, wherever you have green space, uh, by using native plants. We show you what to plant. But today, we're actually going to talk about the species that you don't want in your garden, like the ones that aggressively compete with native plants and just don't provide the food, the shelter, and the nesting habitat that wildlife need to maintain healthy uh, populations. So for some expertise on this topic, I am very pleased to welcome Lauren Bell of the Invasive Species Center who will give us a introduction to some of the common uh, invasive species in Ontario and also what you can do to help control them. Uh, but first, we're going to do a little bit of uh, quick housekeeping. If you missed our past webinars, they are all posted on WWF Canada's YouTube channel. And a reminder that this session is also being recorded. We're going to have a few polls throughout, similar to the one that you answered when joining. And there will be a 20 minute uh, question period at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box and we will try our best to answer them at the end. You might see us mark your question answer live, which means that we have flagged this question for Lauren to answer in person during the Q&A. And during the presentation, I also have my colleague, Ryan Godfrey, who is our WWF resident, there he is, botanist, who will be working hard in the behind the scenes, answering uh, your general questions about wildlife and plants and WWF's work in general. Um, and final reminder, I'm sure this isn't everyone's first Zoom, but uh, just a reminder that the webinar does work the best if you change your view to speaker view uh, in, instead of gallery view, which is at the top of your screen. So a quick special thank you to our key partners on In the Zone, uh, especially Carolinian Canada Coalition and Loblaw Companies Limited, who are our retail partner. So let's get started. Um, I am delighted to introduce Lauren Bell. Lauren is the Education and Community Outreach Coordinator at the Invasive Species Centre. She manages the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network of Ontario. And this network focuses on training and educating community members across Ontario on invasive species identification, management and monitoring. Lauren joined the team in 2016 and has over eight years of experience in the environmental nonprofit sector. She currently sits as the Canadian representative on the Midwest Invasive Plant Network Board of Directors, and she manages the Invasive Species Center's Zooplankton Diagnostics Laboratory. So welcome Lauren and over to you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, as Yarmila said, I'm Lauren Bell. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Coordinator. And today's webinar is titled Invasive Species in Ontario Gardens. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to thank the WWF for the opportunity to speak today um, and also to thank everyone for joining us. So if you're not familiar with the Invasive Species Center, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization based out of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, with uh, satellite offices in Peterborough as well as London. 
We were founded in 2011 with the goal of connecting stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to help prevent the spread of invasive species in Canada. And so this is our center here. Uh, and the next slide, and this is our team. So we have a lot of people on our team that run a lot of different programming. For, for example, we have the Asian Carp Canada program, forest invasive diagnostics. Um, we also have our forest invasives program, zooplankton diagnostics, which we mentioned, um, and a lot of other programs that we're running. So it's always pretty busy, um, and we're really excited to be talking about um, Ontario Gardens today. So on the agenda, we've got a, a lot of different topics we're gonna to be covering off. I think we'll, we're gonna start the presentation with a little bit of a deep dive into what is an invasive species and what makes a species invasive. And then we're gonna kind of do a little bit more specific to invasive garden plants. So as I mentioned at the center, we cover all taxa and a wide range of different species, but it's kind of interesting to take a step inwards and go on a more local level and talk about invasive gardens. The next uh, conversation we're gonna have is a little bit about what we can actually do. So we've learned how to identify and manage a couple of the different species that we're gonna talk about. But what's that next step? As a community, what can we do to help contribute to limiting the spread of invasive species across Ontario? And then at the end, we're gonna talk about some of the resources available and then some time for questions. So before we get going on what is an invasive species, we're just gonna take a second to pull up our second poll to test a little bit of our knowledge on what is an invasive species um, and what are some characteristics and what aren't. So the first question that we're asking is, which of the following is not true about invasive plants? Give it a second here to let's get some answers in. It's got some interesting results coming in, Lauren. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm going to let it go just a few more seconds. People uh, have been reading the question and are busily answering now. Good. Five more seconds or so. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll now and sharing the results. Okay, great. So 74% of people answered any plant grown in a greenhouse. Awesome. So let's kind of deep dive a little bit so we can get a better understanding about what is an invasive species and what is an invasive plant. So this graphic kind of depicts in general, what is an invasive species? So there's this first step. It's an, a species that introduced into an ecosystem outside of its native range, but that can't be where it ends. And as you'll see at the um, a note here, a non-native species does not mean it's an invasive species. And that's a really important clarification. The second step has to occur. It has to have potential impacts on the ecology, the economy, or the society within its introduced range. So that second part is really important. It has to cause impact or harm on one or three of those pillars. So the pillars being ecology, economy, or society. If it doesn't have that harm, then it's not classified as an invasive species. So that distinction is really important. There's a lot of different characteristics for an invasive species, and these are just a couple of them. Invasive species are typically fast growing and quick reproducing. They have a lack of natural predators that would slow their spread. And they target invasive species that have a lack of a defense mechanism. So when invasive species comes in and it can quickly reproduce and take over an area, native species might not have the defense mechanisms in place to help combat that species, which we're gonna talk about some of those specific defense mechanisms that um, the invasive species have as a characteristic. And they come in and they take over an area. A lot of the time, invasive species thrive in disturbed systems, which is where invasive uh, species come in in gardens specifically. So we're gonna talk about some of those examples in a second. Just to put it into a little bit more of an Ontario specific context, at the center, we do work on a national scale, but invasive species in Ontario has some pretty prolific impacts. 
And that's because unfortunately, when it comes to invasive species, Ontario is number one, um, which isn't a place we necessarily want to be. So we do have more invasive species than any other Canadian province or territory. Some of the statistics I've pulled here, the numbers, um, 440 known invasive plants in Southern Ontario, 39 known or invasive insects, 10 invasive tree diseases, and 180 non-native or invasive species within the Great Lakes. So those numbers are, are pretty high, um, and it, that's why we focus a lot of our effort on Ontario. So kind of zoning in a little bit even further to put it into the context of in the zone and the Carolinian zone, it's really important that we focus a lot of our efforts on really vulnerable areas. And the Carolinian zone is an extremely important part of our biodiversity for Canada. It has the highest number of rare plants and animals in the whole country. And it also has a really high population and a small amount of area. We're also, uh, we also focus on the Carolinian zone because there are a lot of points of entry with uh, the Great Lakes being uh, situated so close as well as um, movement of invasive species north from the United States. So it's a particularly vulnerable area and also to kind of compound it, extremely valuable as far as biodiversity is concerned. So it's really an area where we have to focus our efforts because every single action can help contribute to the biodiversity of this important area. So it's, it's a really um, amazing opportunity to talk specifically to the Carolinian zone today, because as far as invasive species, it's one that we're really concerned about and, and um, a lot of action can be done. So I just wanted to draw our attention before we uh, kind of dig into the plants, uh, a little bit about the invasion curve. Some people might be familiar with this, but it's a, a graph uh, and a model that we use really frequently in the invasive species world. And it depicts the likelihood of eradication and control over time from the point of a species arrival. You can see here that as species ar arrival at and after, eradication and actual um, complete removal of a species for let's say plants, for example, if an invasive plant came in, it lowers um, in likelihood as time passes, and it also increases in cost as time passes. So this red circle that we have highlighted here, this is really where we aim to focus when we do our education and outreach training, to raise awareness on a local scale, provincial or a national scale, invasive species need to be focused on at that species arrival stage, because then we have more likelihood of eradication, we have more likelihood of acting as eyes on the ground to stop its introduction at all, so that prevention phase. So it's really important that we have eyes on the ground or management on the ground in that early uh, um, time of infestation, so that we can really focus our efforts and not have to do long-term control over 10, 15, 20 years and really focus on uh, small-scale management. So I just need to note here that preventing the spread of invasive species is the most cost-effective way to reduce the spread of invasive species. So really focusing on that prevention of either preventing species from coming into your garden or preventing the spread outwards into natural areas from your garden. So that's kind of the scope we're going to focus on today. So these next two photos um, are really interesting because I, I took them myself and I think that it really emphasizes really nicely how invasive species can feed off of each other and thrive in disturbed ecosystems. So they don't necessarily compete with each other, but they compete with native species to take over. So it's an unfortunate photo to show the first one is a garden um, here in Sault Ste. Marie. And it, you can see here, we've got that first arrow is Japanese knotweed growing along the uh, side of a, a home. We've got goutweed kind of as the undergrowth, um, choking out any native species on the undergrowth. And then we have garlic mustard um, emitting chemicals to help it grow in that, which we're gonna talk about um, a really good deep dive in that. So it's kind of a, an unfortunate, um, Photo, but I think it, it really highlights the, the fact that invasive species can thrive together and then expand even further. This uh, photo on the right here is Japanese knotweed in a woodlot, um, and then we have Himalayan balsam kind of coming up as the understory. So just to kind of show that invasive species do really commonly exist. Another unfortunate um, collaboration between invasive species is we see a lot with the destruction of ash trees from emerald ash borer. An emerald ash borer infestation will come in and will lose uh, either naturally by uh, deadfall or will lose by 
impact of, of cutting of dead ash trees. And once those trees leave, are removed, then we have an open clearing, usually in full sunlight. So those native species that were thriving in that area where they thrived in a, and had a niche in a, in a shaded environment are now full sun and can no longer live in that environment of that dry uh, soil. So now what happens is invasive species that can have this characteristic of generalists and they can thrive in a lot of different areas are coming in and surviving in those disturbed systems, such as garlic mustard is a great example or um, invasive common buckthorn. They come into these systems and then they thrive where native species can no longer. So we really have a compounded situation where we're having native species being pushed out by an invasive species coming in and then more invasive species coming in and thriving. So you can kind of see how early management and, and some of the tips and tricks we're going to be sharing can be really helpful to avoid situations like this. This is just to highlight a couple of the other impacts. Um, I chose the least uh, gross photo <laughs> I could find of wild parsnip um, impacts. We all know of, of wild parsnip, especially kind of southern eastern Ontario. But that's an example of a human health impact that can be caused by invasive plants. Sometimes the impacts are relatively low and they're more local and community level impacts, such as biodiversity of um, creeping species into new uh, wild areas, for example. But some of the impacts can be very, very serious. Um, not just for biodiversity, but also for human health. And so wild parsnip is a great example of a species that poses a, a huge risk to human health, giant hogweed being one as well. Other potential impacts can include, I, I've included some photos here to highlight, but um, impacts to deterring pollinators, outcompeting native vegetation is the most common impact. They can harbor invasive pathogens. They can impact outdoor spaces and infrastructure, which is a lot of these are going to be shown in examples of plants we're going to talk about. And they can erode banks and increase sediment uh, loading in rivers, which is also can impede um, recreation and outdoor activities as well. So this photo here, I, I always uh, like to show it's from York Region, and it just shows the power of some invasive plants. You can see it pushing up through the asphalt. Um, as well, this um, far right photo of myself is Japanese knotweed to highlight the, the extent of the height that these plants can reach. So it's not always ground covers and kind of um, the normal plants that we're thinking of. They can be pretty monstrous plants as well. So we've talked about what some of the impacts are and let's dig into some of the actual plants themselves. Um, the next plants that I'm going to highlight our species to watch for in your gardens in the Carolinian zone as well can be applied across Ontario. I saw we had a couple uh, folks from outside of southern Ontario and they are invasive plants found across Ontario. But of course, uh, just to take a note that this is not an all encompassing list, of course, a lot of people are going to have a lot of additional plants that they're currently managing. Um, and that's where that resources section at the end I'm hoping can be really helpful is we can talk about some of the resources available for other invasive plant management. So let's dig into it. Uh, we're going to start with what is considered one of Ontario's worst forest invasive species, which is uh, garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is an edible herb. It's native to Europe. It was brought over originally because it's extremely rich in vitamins A and C. The second year plant, which we'll talk about the life cycle, but the second year plant here isn't typically the plant you would eat um, compared to the younger plants because of the root uh, leaves are a little bit bitter. But that being said, just to kind of highlight, why was it planted in the first place? Because it was brought over as an edible herb and just sort of escaped culti cultivation and, and spread like wildfire. So it is considered one of Ontario's most oppressive first invasive species and it, it directly impacts biodiversity pretty severely, more than some of the other plants that we're going to talk about. It does have a two year life cycle, which we'll talk about in the next slide, but you might be wondering, why is it called garlic mustard? Mustard because it's part of the mustard family and garlic because one of the key identification features for this plant is if you were to take those leaves and crush them up in your fingers and smell, it has a really, really strong garlic smell. The first year version of the plant, that smells uh, much stronger. So when you're crushing it in your fingers, you're gonna get a much stronger, mustier garlic smell. But second year plants, it's still the key identification feature. So if you're managing this plant and you're not sure, there's a couple lookalikes, like wild violets, for example. There's a couple lookalike species for the first year. You would crush it if it smells like garlic. It's not deniable. It's very, very garlicky if you've ever smelled it. Um, then you know that it's garlic mustard. 
So that's a really great way that we can easily identify what the species is because it doesn't always have these um, four petaled white flowers. Sometimes they're a bit of a pink hue. It doesn't always have these flowers present. So that's a really great way to, to quickly tell if it's scarlet mustard. The second year plants, which is what we would be managing more actively, you'd focus your management on these second year plants that I've highlighted it here. Um, they have these really long bean pod shaped seed pods. They can produce about 60,000 seeds per dense stand. And so this is, uh, this is the species you're most likely familiar with if you're familiar with garlic mustard is this second year plant. And with that, with the white flowers there. These ones don't have the bean pods present yet. This would have been early May. Um, and the bean pods typically develop later in the season and that's what holds the seeds. So within about five to seven years of garlic mustard coming into a new area, it can establish itself and then become the dominant plant in that area. So it's the dominant plant of the forest understory and then at that point management is extremely difficult, but possible, but if we remember the invasion curve, it's gonna be a longer time before you can actually fully manage and it's gonna be more costly. So it's important to kind of detect those patches early, but, but important to note that infestation uh, management is possible for this plant. It's just a lot of elbow grease, which we'll talk about um, when we get into management. One important, really important feature of this species and kind of pulls into that characteristics factor I talked about before, is that this species is aliopathic. So what that means is it has a natural chemical that occurs within the plant that helps that when it spreads out from the plant, it disperses into the soil and prevents the growth of other species around it. So this means that native species, species at risk, such as American ginseng, for example, when this species comes in, garlic mustard moves into the understory, it releases this aliopathic chemical and then it kills off other plants and grasses in the area so they can't compete uh, in that area when those native plants are displaced, die off, the garlic mustard will then move into those disturbed areas. So you can see the, the issues with that. Um, that's one of the biggest ecological impacts is that overtaking of the forest floor. It also has a couple economic impacts, which I list here. Long-term management plans can require um, really long, kind of a lot of uh, manual labor, for example, um, as well as those dense stands can double in size every four years. So it's a really quick producing species. Some, a little bit more on the identification if you were looking to manage. Just to note that um, this time of year is not the time of year to be managing garlic mustard, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, but it's important to equip ourselves with this knowledge for next growing season so we can know kind of what to prepare ourselves for. If you, if you are actively managing garlic mustard, you know um, the amount of work that can go into it, but um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the success we've seen with our garlic mustard removal project. The first year plant you can see on the left-hand side of this graphic here, that's a basil rosette. And that's the first year plant. That species, the uh, garlic mustard is evergreen plant, so it will exist under the snow during the winter, build its root system, and then appear in the spring as this second year plant that produces seed. So this photo here shows the basil rosette. You can see those kind of kidney shaped sort of, uh, you can see how it can be mistaken with violet. Um, and then if you crush those leaves, they'd have a really strong garlic smell. So that's how you know right away um, that it was garlic mustard. And they grow and they get the name basil rosette because they grow in this cluster where they all come from one single stem. All those um, individual leaves come from one single stem under the soil. So that's a really great way to identify it. Um, they are a pretty light green, kind of really, really uh, ribbed and lots of deep veins. And then the second year plants have a much more triangular shaped leaf um, and they have the white flowers and, and bean pods. So management. Taking a look at garlic mustard, this um, patch is here in Sault Ste. Marie and it's one of the active uh, sites that we're managing. Um, it can be hand pulled and that is the recommended way to manage garlic mustard is by hand pulling. It's really important to make sure with any management plan that you are going to be able to follow up year over year for management because starting a, garlic mustard is a great example of a plant that if you start a, um, a management plan for a couple of years, typically our management plans we see about seven to 10 years. Um, 
sounds really, really intense, but um, for our one management plan, we have about 15 volunteers pulling on a very, very large site one day a year. Um, we do also other sites locally, um, and the management can be done in about a day per year. So just to keep that in mind, um, it, it, it is a lot of work, but it is possible. Um, and it's also really important uh, to, to manage relic mustard. Otherwise, every year that you put off management, um, it will get larger. We know that it doubles in size every four years. So like I said, this isn't the time to be managing garlic mustard, but it is the time to be keeping an eye out, do, doing identification for those first year plants. They'll still be there. Um, and looking out for any remaining second year plants that you might see. The seeds have already dropped. Uh, they drop typically between mid-May to June. Um, to, in Northern Ontario, we see um, a later June drop, but in Southern Ontario, you'd probably see likely early June. And so it's a little bit late for this year, but next year you'll have a lot of time to kind of prepare our management because if we don't do a year over year management plan, we can actually impede management in the future. Um, plants can grow resiliency fairly quickly, so it's really important to make sure that you are focusing on the outer edge of an infestation and just doing what you can to work the outer leading edge. If you picture the infestation like a circle, working your way in from the outside and removing those satellite populations is going to be huge for management next year um, in the in the previous in the next growing season. Sorry. Um, so it's really important to manage those outlying populations first rather than starting from the middle and working our way out, which is a common um, thing that I, I, I work with a lot of people to do management plans and that's one of the things we see is it's a bit daunting to work from the outside in, but it's actually more appropriate to work from the outside. Um, and the second part, which is, is good to know because we know that it's two phases of a life cycle, it's really important to focus your efforts only on the seed producing plants when you're starting management. At the very end, we'll work on, and this is all in the best management practices, which I'll talk about in a second, but at the end of any rest of any management plan, we want to focus on restoration and how can we build native plants back into that. But at the very beginning of any management, you really want to focus your efforts on what can I do this growing season and what's going to have the biggest impact. And for garlic mustard, it's only focusing your efforts on the second year seed producing plants. Pulling the first year isn't as effective. Um, the root, if you don't get the whole root system, it's going to overwinter and the roots will uh, form new plants. But it's really important to stop the seeds from dropping of the second year because then you're removing all those seeds from the seed bank. There's about, uh, there can be one seed pod that drops can live in the soil for about 30 years. So it's really important to remove that plant before the seed pods. And I think it's also really helpful to have something to target. So we don't have to remove every single garlic mustard plant first or second that we see. We can focus our efforts and really be strategic about the, the effort we're putting in. So, I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about for garlic mustard, but if we want to, um, on today's webinar, I want to make sure we get time to talk about a lot of different plants. So, I wanted to take, for every species I'm going to talk about, I'm going to highlight some of the resources that are available. By no means is anyone alone in their management. There's a lot of different resources and um, tips that we put together, and I want to highlight some of them for garlic mustard. So, for example, if you go to the Invasive Species Center website, invasivespeciescenter.ca, there's a lot of different tips. Um, this, we have the best management practice, which is a document that um, outlines how to manage invasive species based on your criteria, based on what uh, resources are available to you, manual, chemical, which um, chemical should always be a last resort, um, and in a lot of cases is not appropriate. So, the, it really highlights a lot of the great manual removal. I created a one pager, which you can find on the website of how to properly remove uh, garlic mustard by hand, uh, which is the preferred method and, and the most effective method. And then we also have a how to remove garlic mustard video that we produced this summer. So check that out if you're interested. It's on our YouTube page as well, and you can check out more about how to manage garlic mustard. This map here just highlights the introduction um, and spread of garlic mustard that's been reported. So we're gonna talk about reporting at the end, but it's really important to report invasive species in your community. This is just one example for education and outreach. Um, we know that there are not just uh, four in the chatham Ken area uh, garlic mustard patches, we know that, but this is the best glimpse we have at what has been reported by communities. So make sure that 
if you're interested, you get out and do some reporting. It's a really great way to contribute to the database and to understand the distribution for us in the invasive species field, as well as for you. You can see if you don't have garlic mustard on your property, well, is there garlic mustard found in your community? Should you be concerned about walking trails in your area that spreading seeds that way? Gives you an idea of kind of what might be coming to the doorstep. So it's really important. So we'll talk about that at the end, but this is just to show that there is um, some great reporting of distribution of garlic mustard. It's typically found in sunny and shaded areas. It's a species that grows essentially anywhere and everywhere. It's really, really good at spreading and it doesn't really have a preferred area. Um, it has spread throughout all of Ontario. We have it very heavily here um, and in Northern Ontario, as well as, of course, in Southern Ontario. Um, and it does have populations in Western and Atlantic Canada as well. Okay, so the second species that we're going to talk about is Himalayan balsam. And this one's maybe a, another one that we've seen around. Um, and sometimes I met with um, some questions about, well, what is the issue with Himalayan balsam if it's such an amazing pollinator attractor? Um, so that's something that we're going to talk about today. So just a bit of an introduction, if you're not familiar with Himalayan balsam, it's an invasive herbaceous species. It was originally introduced into North America as a garden ornamental plant. And it can grow a lot higher than a lot of people think. You, it can reach heights of three meters. Um, and we've seen that pretty commonly actually in Northern Ontario. Uh, we've done surveys all across Ontario and here in Northern Ontario, we, it, it typically does reach that three meter height. And I've seen a lot of um, daunting photos from Southern Ontario of it reaching over top of people's decks um, and really high heights. So it is a bit taller than a lot of people expect. And, and that's one of the key identification features that differentiates it from some other native species. Um, but it is a touch-me-not plant. So what that means is it spreads by seed and when the seeds dry out throughout the growing season, they mature and they dry and then any type of vibration will cause them to pop and spread up to five meters away from the parent plant. So this could be naturally through wind or it could be people brushing up against it. Um, it could be pollinators coming in and, and touching the seed. Um, any type of vibration, it's very sensitive and it will just pop and seeds will fly um, everywhere. Maybe we've seen um, them with some other species or you've seen the seeds pop yourself. Um, but yeah, so that's what gives it the classification of a touch me not plant. So one of the reasons, and, and, and each seed pod will typically have about 16 seeds. Um, one of the reasons why this plant is sometimes welcomed into Ontario gardens is because it is seen as a pollinator attractor, which is true. One of the characteristics of this invasive plant is it's extremely prolific nectar producer. So it produces more nectar than almost any other touch me not plant. Um, and this is, seems great because you have, you go this photo here at the bottom, um, I took and, and when we were in there, there was hundreds and hundreds of bees and wasps <laughs> while you were in there. So not great, it is a walking trail, so not great for walking, but great for pollinators. Um, and the issue with this is that because it's so prolific, it's actually a competitive advantage. So it pulls pollinators from other native species and they actually can outcompete because these other species are not getting as pollinated as um, this invasive Himalayan balsam, they will eventually die out. And then Himalayan balsam will impede that area and grow in the area where the native species have died out. So it actually uses its nectar production as a competitive advantage against native species. And there's a lot of other uh, great pollinating plants that are better at attracting pollinators uh, and produce just a lot of nectar as well that can, that Himalayan balsam can be avoided because it does create these dense monocultures um, and the payoff of attracting pollinators um, versus what it does to native species um, just isn't there. So it's just a plant to be avoided. It's not commonly uh, sold in, in garden houses anymore and, and so that's great, but it is still one that sometimes we really have to push the messaging of, well, there's a lot of great alternatives to Himalayan balsam. Um, and it's great that it attracts pollinators, but there's some negative consequences to that too. I just wanted to take a second to highlight a, a common uh, in native lookalike species. This is the spotted jewelweed, which maybe we're, we're really familiar with. It's native to Ontario and it's also a touch me not plant. So that's what gives it kind of the, the lookalike. Um, main difference is just general size, leaf shape, the leaves of the uh, 
spotted jewelry are uh, soft to the touch as well as scalloped edges, not jagged uh, kind of razor edges such as the um, Himalayan balsam. And it's just a lot smaller. It, it can reach heights um, typically about 1.5 meters, but it just doesn't reach that three meter height. And then the most obvious difference is uh, the flower. But it's important to remember that the flower is not present all year, so it shouldn't be the only identifying characteristic. But it is a good way to tell this time of year. It's a perfect identification feature. Um, it has that bright orange spotted, which gives it the name spotted jewelweed. Um, and Himalayan balsam flowers are pink to sometimes a deep purple color. So, and the leaves are much, much longer, about double the size. So there's some identification characteristics there. This time of year is a great time to, to see those characteristics. Some of the impacts, this photo here um, is a hiking trail uh, that's been pretty heavily taken over. That photo I showed of Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam coexisting, um, that was taken in this exact same area. So the trail is slowly uh, being eaten up by Himalayan balsam. Um, it's become a pretty dense monoculture. So there's nothing on the forest floor except for more Himalayan balsam. So it's just kind of a great photo to emphasize the impact of, that this plant can have. It produces these really, really dense stands and it, it limits nutrients and habitat availability for other species. And then as you can see here, these are probably about almost at the three meter mark. Um, and there's just intense shading happening below. So it, it outcompetes native species that way. So one Himalayan balsam plant can produce about 800 seeds. Um, so the bean pods can hold about 16 seeds, but a over its lifetime, it will just keep reproducing more and more seed. Um, so it's really important to know that it can just spread naturally even without human uh, interception through wind or it can spread through human uh, movement as well. Especially when we have people digging them out and bringing them to their gardens, um, that's one of the issues that we, we deal with as well because it can aggressively replace perennials um, along riverbanks as well. And that's where that sediment loading can come in because the root system of Himalayan balsam is only about an inch deep. It's really easy to hand pull, pull which we'll talk about in a second, um, which is great for management, but for, for a species that loves kind of damp areas, it's really bad for riverbanks to have Himalayan balsam on them because when the plant dies, there's no root system in there and it'll just, it'll just lead to erosion and, and sediment depositing downstream. So that's one of the outcomes that we see from it as well. As far as management, um, more so than garlic mustard, um, garlic mustard is just not an effective time to, to manage it right now. Um, but for Himalayan balsam, it is a hindrance to manage it right now. Um, this plant uh, should not be touched this time of year. The seed pods are extremely dry and by going in, you can actually spread the seeds even further. One of the other, um, the, the good part about Himalayan balsam is it can be managed by hand and it should be managed by hand. That's the most effective way to manage it. It's really, really easy to pull. Um, you don't need to wait for kind of damp soil like you do with a lot of other uh, species that can help, help management. This one you can just pull. Um, again, it, it is labor intensive because that's easy to say, but if you have a hundred, <laughs> that can be a bit time intensive, but hand pulling is the most important part. It's kind of a two-part management. You're gonna remove the seeds from spreading into next year, and then you're also removing the plant um, so that it can't produce seed by managing it early in the spring. So management for this one is actually, if in the grand scheme of invasive plants, is not too, too tricky because the seeds are really not very robust. They only last about 18 months in the soil. So management can be completed realistically in about two years if every plant is removed. If you're to miss even one plant, you can hinder management for the next year because one plant can have lots of seed pods and can spread up to 800 seeds as mentioned. So it's really important to make sure that you're capturing every single seed um, and every single plant, uh, sorry, every plant before they set seed um, so that you can really stop the spread from in the next year. And, and just, just to note that the reason that you're not pulling it this year is because when you can spread those seeds, it can lead to further infestations when they're deposited into the soil. And also you can bring those seeds back with you unknowingly um, and move them around in that area. So it's just recommended to not go into an area full of Himalayan balsam this time of year. And all that being said, of course, there's a lot of resources available for Himalayan balsam management. So 
check out our, our resource page on uh, the invasive species center.ca and you can check out to see some of the resources that are available for management um, for this species specifically. This is the mapped distribution. Um, it's spread pretty widely across Canada and it can be found in eight provinces currently. So again, we're, we're doing a push to get some more reports in for the species, especially in kind of the, the Chatham Kent, Southern Ontario winter area. Um, but yeah, this is the known distribution so far. So you can see there have been quite a few reports, especially kind of that North Toronto area. Um, and this is the known distribution to date. So found, like I said, eight provinces, so pretty widespread across Canada, but one that we can, we can manage in our own backyards, which is great. The next one I wanted to touch on is, uh, I'm using this as an example of a invasive ground cover. So there's a lot of invasive ground covers that we deal with at the center. And I just wanted to take one to highlight kind of the impacts because impacts of invasive ground covers are very common. The last species that we talked about are not very commonly found in greenhouses and garden stores and grocery stores, which is actually a really big um, uh, seller of, of plants. Um, and so we, this is the last ones that we talked about are not very commonly sold. They can, can be, it's not illegal. They're not on the Invasive Species Act, but it's not very common that they're sold. This one is an example of a plant that can very commonly be purchased um, at garden centers and, and a lot of different areas. And it's one that we're often hit with a mixed reaction because it really thrives. So periwinkle, we, it, there's two different types of uh, species of periwinkle. There's vinca minor and vinca major. Vinca minor is what we know as um, common periwinkle and vinca major is similar in appearance, but just generally larger. The leaves and, and flowers are a bit larger, but they're both native to the Mediterranean basin and both considered invasive in Ontario. The key ID feature is this five petaled kind of, it's sometimes a bit pink, um, but most of the time you'll find it, it's a purple color flower. And it is an example of another evergreen. So it lives under the soil. Um, these dark uh, waxy kind of dark green leaves live under the soil, build their root system and then come back the next year. And it's vine-like in that it has these thin tendrils that grow out from the plant and they can, they can mat together and then cause tripping hazards, which which we have here um, in one of our parks in this area um, and is one of the impacts of the species too, is just the dense matting that can form. And, it, and another impact of this species is it does reproduce vegetatively, so it doesn't spread by seed com very commonly. So that's an issue for fragmentation. So if the species was to be managed and, and clipped, but not all the clippings were collected or a piece went downstream, um, if you're working next to a water body, that fragment can spread into a new infestation. So it's something that we really have to monitor and, and management and disposal methods are really important for this one. So it can grow in a lot of different environments, but it thrives in moist conditions. It can quickly escape cultivation and then take over an area, as you can see in this photo here. So a lot of nurseries do work to exclude this plant for sale, but the plant can still be commonly grown um, in gardening stores and nurseries and grocery stores, like I said. So the onus is really on us as consumers to make sure that we're really aware of what we're purchasing so that we know what's going into the ecosystem because your garden is part of the ecosystem and it's part of the biodiversity. So while we are continuing to work with nurseries, if there's a demand, there's likely going to be a product. So we just have to make sure that we're really aware of what we're purchasing and what we're putting in. And periwinkle is a, a really great example of that. Some of the impacts are similar to the other plants, costly to remove, creates a tripping hazard, which we see with a lot of vine-like uh, plants. And it, it does creep, so it can quickly take over a wild area. We see this especially when there's improper disposal, like using a compost. Invasive plants should never, under any circumstances, be composted. Um, because this is uh, what happened in this photo up here, is a composting um, escapee. So important to note that it can outcompete all the native vegetation along the forest floor, including saplings of trees, which has some big in, uh, implications as well. As far as management, um, as with any invasive plant, the best step is just to avoid planting this to begin with. It, I know that it's commonly planted in areas where other things won't grow. Um, and there's a reason why it grows so well in shaded areas 
um, and that's because of its invasive characteristics. So it will require, like any other plant, some year-over-year -year management to help control the, the spread. And it's important to note that with any management technique, every area might be different. So you and your uh, personal property, you might not have any issues with periwinkle. It doesn't spread. You have it next to sidewalk where it's impermeable and it doesn't spread. But then there's a second step that we should look at, which is, okay, well, if you're managing, um, just doing clippings, for example, to keep it kind of in check and that's working, what are you doing with the clippings? Because there could be some implications at the compost or at the landfill, if you're disposing of them that way, that there's some un sight unseen uh, implications to periwinkle that we have to be aware of. Um, so that's one thing is, is not everyone's going to have the same uh, issues with every plant that's listed, but periwinkle is a good example of that divide. A lot of people uh, really like the plant and a lot of people don't. So we just wanted to kind of highlight some of the issues with it and why we should avoid planting it to begin with. Um, the main issue with periwinkle is the creeping. So it creeps out of the area where it's originally planted and it creeps quickly. So for management of periwinkle, it's important to keep the plant, uh, if it is in the area already and full management, like in the last photo, isn't possible. It's important to keep the plant back and contained um, as much as possible. Removing the roots along that leading edge. So if we picture it like a circle again, making sure that on the outer rim of the circle that we're always maintaining those plants first, and removing those so that it doesn't creep further while we're managing, uh, trying to do active management. You can manually remove the plants by hand. It's, it's a lot of uh, manual work, um, like all of them, but picking the plants out by hand or using a rake to help kind of bring the runners up, cutting those, and then giving you better access to the ground and pulling the and, and managing the roots that way is also. Um, it's important to note that removing the full root is really important, just like with garlic mustard, uh, because if you don't, then the plant will just re sprout from, from that root. So. That's periwinkle, and that's just kind of a, a, a taste of some invasive ground covers that we deal with um, pretty commonly with homeowners um, that come and, and we talk to them about some of their management options. Other ground covers that I wanted to note to avoid is, for example, gout weed. A lot of people have gout weed in their gardens. Um, it can be easily controlled, uh, but management can be pretty tricky. So removal, eradication is the really tricky part. Management, because the root system doesn't go super deep, it can be fairly simple to, in most cases, to kind of create that impermeable edge using um, garden gating and, and things like that. But the best tip is to just avoid it to begin with because it can quickly take over. Um, this is a very unfortunate photo that I always like to highlight. It's a, an invasive garden, I call it. Um, you've got periwinkle as you start from the left, um, periwinkle matting, into variegated gout weed in the middle and then regular gout weed on the one side. Um, and management for this would be pretty tricky because it's pretty widespread, but just to show kind of the, the invasive plants thriving together as well. And then this is a woodlot that was overtaken by a, a plant called yellow archangel. So another one that definitely recommend avoiding, similar to gout weed, but has a really fuzzy uh, thick leaf um, in comparison. So. Check those out um, if you're interested in learning more about those two species. Those are definitely invasive ground covers. The last one I'm going to run through um, as far as invasive plants go is English ivy. This is a good example of an invasive vine. So I wanted to give a little bit of a, a feel for a lot of different kind of types of plants that we work with at the Invasive Species Center. So this is English ivy, very, very commonly sold, especially at grocery stores. Um, very common sold invasive plant. It's a good example of a plant that if it's indoors, if it's potted and not in a, in a natural system, it's okay. It's one that if, if it's a species that you really like, growing it indoors, it is a bit tricky to grow indoors. Um, it's not quite as simple as, as it thrives outside. Um, so sometimes people are a bit confused about why it's on the list because it dies inside. Um, and so it's a good one I always like to highlight just to kind of show that it's not always a absolutely not, you cannot have this plant. It's more of a, these are some of the alternatives. The alternative for English ivy being bring it inside and bring it into a pot. Um, and then we don't have to worry about creeping into natural systems. So this is a native uh, to Europe and Western Asia, Northern Europe and Western Asia, uh, this plant. And it's typically planted as an ornamental climbing plant to cover 
um, the ground or, for example, Ivy League um, is a phrase we hear quite a bit. Um, and that's an example of, it's kind of used to drape over um, brick and it uses that waxy leaf that you can see to grip onto the and climb uh, up any type of material. So it's a really good climber, um, which we'll see in the next photo. Oh, in two photos, sorry. Um, you can see a good glimpse of the waxy leaf in this um, impact slide. That's the leaf that's used to climb and it's a really excellent climber. So this one has a lot of different impacts. Um, economically, it forms these dense mats that can damage infrastructure, which you'll see in the next slide. It creates a tripping hazard from matting similar to periwinkle. Um, loss of culturally important trees. This one really is an, a really strong impact to trees. And the difference with this one with the ground covers is that not only are saplings and kind of more vulnerable young trees impacted, but there's also a huge impact on mature, long-standing trees. So this species will climb up the tree, take over the entire tree, including branches and leaves, and then this tree can no longer photosynthesize and will eventually die. So it's a kind of jarring example of not just kind of the more vulnerable species on the forest floor can be impacted, but also our mature trees, which of course has social impacts as well. A lot of us um, have really important trees. We know if we've lost trees to uh, your um, emerald ash borer, for example, um, it can have a prolific impact on our properties um, and they're just socially, culturally important trees. So losing them to this vine um, is, is pretty disappointing. So it's something that we want to manage uh, right off the bat. And also there is a human health impact to this plant because it's believed to be poisonous uh, to humans if consumed. So this photo really highlights what I'm talking about. It's not just the forest floor that we have to worry about. It's also um, infrastructure. So you can see that it's starting to move over onto the table um, at this park. And if this was a public uh, Ontario park, for example, um, there could be implications to that too, um, infrastructure damage. And then also, of course, the most kind of jarring is that this full mature tree is being taken over by this vine. And eventually, if not managed, um, this tree could be killed because it doesn't uh, have the ability to have get any photosynthesis. So for management of English ivy, essentially you're going to want to cut it. If it's climbing up your tree, you're going to want to cut it at a comfortable height. So any height that you're able to reach. This plant vines from that point up can be pulled and are bagged, are dead essentially, once you've solarized them. And then it's just the ground that you have to worry about. So at least you're stopping it from spreading any further up the tree and attacking the tree leaf. But then it's important to get to kind of pull those vines and shoots from below the ground and bagging those. So making sure that you're doing a year over year effort's gonna help remove that seeping um, and, and keep that plant from going any further. So that cutting at a comfortable height is really important because it breaks your management into two sections. You have to pull the plants from the top and then just remove the vines uh, that are climbing it. And this one, just to note that there's um, very, it's always important to wear gloves when doing a management of any type of invasive plant, but this one specifically has been known very commonly to cause light dermatitis um, and skin rashes. So handle English ivy with care, definitely. And then just before we, we uh, go into what you can do, just don't forget to check your trees as well. Your trees are an important part of biodiversity, just like your gardens. Um, and so there's a lot of different things you can uh, look for. We're not going to talk about invasive um, pathogens and insects in this webinar, but there's a lot of resources out there to help you check your trees. I just highlighted two examples. This is um, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is found in the Niagara region in Ontario. It's an invasive insect that takes over eastern hemlock trees and Carolinian hemlock trees. And then we also have dieback from Asian longhorn beetle, which isn't um, established in Canada, but is one that we're always acting as eyes on the ground. So just to say that always be checking your trees. If there's unusual symptoms happening on your tree, find out first what the tree is, um, if you already know, and then see what pests or, or pathogens um, target that tree specifically and look for some of those signs and symptoms. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do. I just wanted to, to start off by, by kind of highlighting the fact that your garden does have an impact on the biodiversity of your community. 
Um, sometimes it feels very, very, very local level. What can my garden have to do with kind of the biodiversity of Ontario? But when you take that number and multiply it by all of the different um, lands that we have in Ontario um, and different types of uh, management happening on it, it's really, it is an important part. And it's important to make sure that your, that your backyard or, or your woodlot or your property that you own has a positive impact on biodiversity. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. I like to use this photo, which we created for Invasive Species Awareness Week a couple years ago. I always like it to use it to remind people that your backyard ponds are also part of your gardening and part of your kind of biodiversity that you're contributing to your community. So make sure that you're being really conscious in backyard ponds as well, of what you're planting and what you're putting in that pond. Water hyacinth being a common species that's really actively managed in the United States and is still for sale in, in um, Ontario. So one that we always recommend not. This is just to highlight um, the fact that we talk a little bit about management, but it's really important that your management includes proper disposal techniques. This is an example of Himalayan balsam being thrown into a woodlot um, that had in, in grass clippings that they didn't know that they were spreading Himalayan balsam, but these grass clippings now have Himalayan balsam spreading into that uh, woodlot. And just an example of this was a former compost pile um, and is now kind of a, a Himalayan balsam garden. So it's just important to note that your disposal should always be part of your management plan. And we're gonna talk about the general rules of disposal now. Step one is just to always wear gloves when removing invasive plants. A lot of plants in general, um, everyone has different reactions to plants, but a lot of invasive plants have one of their characteristics being um, the potential to cause dermatitis and, and, and especially with people with sensitive skin. So just always best to wear gloves, waterproof gloves. Um, the second part, these are really general rules. So it's important to make sure that you're consulting your best management practice if one exists. Um, because for example, you might have an only clear bag rule in your um, district, which means that you'd have to adapt these um, by using tarps and, and things like that. So these are really general, but in general, Make sure that you're placing every and all plant parts in construction grade garbage bags. So that construction grade is the most important part. Um, using a regular garbage bag, there's gonna be tears, there's gonna be wear from being in direct sunlight. Um, so construction grade just gives you that extra level of insurance that your bag is actually sealed and you're not distributing seeds or plant parts when you move the bag. And those are available at any grocery store or hardware store. Um, and then the second part is just making sure you leave it on a hard surface and that's just because, uh, or a tarp, and that's just because if you have an invasive plant in a bag and there are tears for any reason, even if you put sticks in and when you're dealing with Japanese knotweed, it can be fairly sharp. Um, so construction grade might not also be up to the task always. So if there are small, small holes, you're not directly putting them into soil where they can then seed. Uh, so that's why we put them on a hard surface. And then um, in most uh, jurisdictions, you're just gonna solarize those for at least one week and that's gonna kill off all viable plant parts. And then you're gonna dispose of that uh, in your normal trash. And again, those are general guidelines, but they work for most invasive species. Some of the other ways just generally that you can help contribute to stopping the spread of invasive species is making sure that you're not dumping your bait. If you're an outdoor person that enjoys angling, um, that's one that we always push the messaging buying and burning local firewood, but also buying local soil and not distributing soil over long distances. The general rule of thumb is within 80 kilometers and the law for firewood is 80 kilometers, um, not, not moving firewood. And that can mean bringing invasive pests and pathogens into your area if you're bringing firewood or soil into your um, yards. And then also just uh, cleaning your boots and outdoor gear. That includes when you're managing invasive plants, just using, sometimes we use, um, the finger brushes that you can buy from the dollar store that makes a good boot brush or you can buy formal boot brushes from a lot of different venues. And then also just choosing native species. And, and that's kind of what today's been all about. So before we talk about reporting quickly, I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions. But before we talk about reporting, um, let's just take a quick poll to see how many people have reported an invasive species. It'd be interesting to know uh, before we kind of talk about the importance.
Okay, Lauren, we have lots of answers coming in. I'm going to let it go for a few more seconds. Awesome. And I'll cut it off in just two more seconds. There we go. And sharing results. Okay, so not a lot of people have reported invasive species. And that's really good to know because I'm going to take a second to highlight some of the reasons why. Why is it important to, to report invasive species? And it's important on a national, provincial, community scale, but it's also important um, for you to understand what you can do with the reportings um, that are coming in to help protect and, and inform yourself of invasive species threats to your own backyard. So this is EdMaps, and what it is is the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. We have one specific to Ontario that's run by our partners at the Invading Species Awareness Program in Peterborough. It's available as a phone application or a website. I'm just going to be talking really quickly about it, but there's a lot of different resources. By going to edmaps.org slash Ontario, you can get the entire training materials. Um, there's a, we have webinars on it. We have um, digital videos that show you how to download and use it. So there's a lot of different resources available after the webinar. And of course, you can always reach out and ask um, for some more advice on EdMaps. But essentially how it works is you make an observation, you enter that information into an EdMaps profile that you've created on the website. It's either confirmed or not confirmed by an expert verifier at um, the Invading Species Awareness Program. It's then, once it's confirmed, it's added onto the, Nash, or onto the provincial database so then everyone can see it. It's a part of the log. We understand that there's a species that's been reported in that area. And it's really important for a lot of different reasons. So some of the, yeah, so this is just, in, just that in a graphic form. So it's either confirmed or denied, and then it's available for everyone to see if there's giant hogweed reported on the cul-de-sac in your area and you're concerned because it's an area that you walk through quite frequently, you can go and see where giant hogweed has been reported in your area so that you can make informed decisions about A, just where you'll interact with in that space, and then also incoming threats, for example, if there were species that are not currently found in Canada and you were to report an Asian longhorn beetle, for example, there would be a response plan by the authorities for that species, and it can make an actual very real large scale change um, and impact um, all the way down to kind of a community level impact. So there's a lot of different reasons to report. All you need to know for reporting is the date you saw it, the habitat approximately, was it along a road, was it in a forested area, the location just based off of a map, you can put in GIS coordinates or you can just select from the map, and then photos for verification. Next slide. So um, there's a lot of different reasons and, and reports can be used for a lot of different things. For example, they can be for education and outreach like we're using today. We use them in an education capacity. They can help us understand the leading edge of new infestations. Like we know that uh, dog strangling vine has never been reported in Sault Ste. Marie, but it's very common in Southern Ontario. So those reports that are coming in really help us give an understanding of the leading edge of that infestation. It helps us understand movement over time. If you're eradicated a species, you can put that information in and we can understand better where the management's happening. And it can uh, help influence policy or enact a response plan for those really high priority species that, that come in. And some of those high priority species include um, species that aren't currently found in Canada or Ontario that are, could be pond plants, for example, or some of the species listed as high priority. And there's a couple other ways to report as well. You can report to the Canadian Food Inspections Agency, or you can report to the Invading Species Hotline directly if you wanted to talk to someone um, about EdMaps specifically. Some of the questions we get sometimes are, well, why the Canadian Food Inspection Agency? What do they have to do with invasive species? And the, the general answer is the, the CFA is one of the highest authorities on invasive plant pests. Um, is the highest authority on invasive plant pests that pertain to food and plants in Canada. Invasive species can be a national security risk, especially when they impact uh, food production. So that's kind of where the CFA comes in. They're making sure that import and exports are really uh, heavily monitored. Um, we know what's coming into the country and we know what's leaving. 
And it's really important for CFIA that if you become aware of a plant pest not previously known to exist in your area, that you do report it to them. So uh, there's a couple different ways you can report, but just dotting down this email, surveillance at inspection.gc.ca is a great way to get in touch um, if you have concerns about invasive species. And just making sure that you're always that you're always planting native species or at least trying your best to find the resources um, to help guide you in that. Not transporting soil over long distances and consulting the Grow Me Instead guide for your species. And so if you're not familiar with it, this is the Grow Me Instead guide. It's produced uh, by the Horticultural Outreach Collaborative here in Ontario. Um, and it, that's a committee run by our partners at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council who do amazing work with invasive plant um, and plant management. This is a brand new, the 2020 edition. So this is the third edition available and it's available on their website for a digital download as well as our website. And I just really like this quote that came from within and I think it helps tie everything together nicely is that gardening is a popular activity in Southern Ontario and around the world. And when practiced in a thoughtful manner, it's part of society's wise response to climate change and biodiversity loss, two of our greatest global challenges. So I think that's a nice kind of quote to summarize uh, some of the reasons why gardening and native gardening is so important. Just to highlight as well that um, on the Invasive Species Center website, if instead of Googling for every management practice that exists for your species that you're worried about, you can just check out our database. It's fairly comprehensive. Of course, if you think we've missed any, just reach out to the email provided on the page there, but it is a comprehensive list of the best management practices that are available um, across all species um, that we've been able to find in existence. So it's a really great place, one-stop shop to start and check out how to manage your species effectively based on the science and, and research gone into. And that can all be found on our Invasive Species Center website. There's a lot of different resources we have on our page, best management practices. Our species pro uh, profiles are where you'll find all the info about uh, the species I talked about today and more and then some video resources um, and a lot of other items. So I recommend checking it out if you're interested in, in learning more. Some of those resources that we listed are, are here. They're, these are available on the website, technical management bulletins, best management practices. And if you're interested in kind of a more educational capacity, we have some fact sheets that link invasive species and their impacts on different things, such as municipal assets, um, climate change, uh, species at risk and also the invasion curve. So if you wanted to deep dive a little bit more about the importance of that curve that we talked about at the beginning. You can also find more about our webinar series. So we have a new webinar series that started this year. Our next one is on October 29th um, and it's an update on beach leaf disease. So if that was a species of concern that you're worried about or you're worried about the state of the beach trees um, in your property, you can check out that by going to our website and get And so some of the other items that we have is you can join our mailing list to register for our newsletter if you're interested in learning more about that. And also we have our bi-weekly media scan where we um, create a list of all the upcoming media um, and events for, the, for Ontario and Canada-wide, as well as some international features. And that's just a great way to stay up to date on some of the news coming out um, in the invasive species world. And that's our website there, invasivespeciescenter.ca, if you are interested in learning more. And that's it for me. This is my um, contact information. So please reach out if you uh, have any questions um, in the future. We're always available to help. Um, and yeah, I'll turn it over to some questions. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, that was really a fantastic uh, and very informative um, presentation. And uh, I've, I've certainly learned a ton. So thank you for that. And I, I feel confident that we have armed our audience with uh, all the information they need to really go out there and, and start helping to uh, combat those invasive species in their neighborhoods. Um, so we are gonna go to questions now. Thanks for everyone um, adding them. And we've got, we quite, quite a few. Um, so I think I'll start with um, 
there were a few that were um, sort of a follow-up to garlic mustard uh, management. So one of them was regarding, you were saying um, that this isn't the time of year to man, this is not the time of year to manage garlic mustard by hand pulling, but is there any reason why we as gardeners can't weed it out when we are able to do that? Or is it, is, isn't that better than doing nothing at all? Yeah, really great question. It just comes down to the biology of the plant. To manage it now is not the most effective use of, of the effort that goes into it because the seed pods have already dropped. So removing it now, you would just be removing the material, but you wouldn't be um, removing its ability to spread next year. So those seeds have already dropped. The cycle has already been put in place that it will now produce a first year plant next year and then a second year plant in two years. So by managing it right now after the seeds have already dropped, yes, you are removing that material, but that's all you're doing. You're not actively removing the plant before it sets seed and before it drops seed. So if it's a sightly issue or an aesthetics issue, definitely you can remove it, but the process and cycle unfortunately has already been set forth. Um, the seeds have already dropped into the soil, so you won't be limiting the spread for next year. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there was a follow-up question for uh, garlic mustard, and that is how long should you wait until you plant anything where you have yeah. pulled out garlic mustard uh, with reference to the alleopathic chemical properties? Um, apparently this person has heard that jewel weed has successfully outcompeted garlic mustard in certain areas, and can this be planted the same year that the garlic mustard is pulled? Yeah, great question. Jewelweed is actually one that I've very commonly heard of people planting um, in place of because it can handle um, chemically rich soil. Um, so that's interesting to hear a more confirmation on that. Um, but yes, as far as management uh, restoration, typically a management plan for garlic mustard, if you look at the best management practice, is about seven years. So in that seven year, and, and the best management practices are great because they go year by year kind of what to expect. If you were to keep up an active management year over year, typically when we do ours, we see about year four, we start to see at least a 55% reduction in total second year plants, which is great. That's, it doesn't seem like a lot, but after that, once you've removed, because you know it's every two years, once you've removed those second years up to that point, you start to see really significant reduction after that. So I would probably say rule of thumb, every site is different. I would, I would aim for about year seven of management. So you want to have the area have less than, this is an approximate number, but less than about 20% of garlic mustard cover. And then you're going to be able to start establishing some new plants now that they're not competing with that garlic mustard. So I would wait till around year seven uh, of the management plan to start doing restoration. But again, it totally depends. If you have a really small, really, really early infestation, the seed bank only has maybe one year of seeds, you could start your restoration in year two or year three. But if you have a, an average size kind of, and it, it explains this really well in the management practice too, if you have a, a small um, to medium size infestation, then every year uh, the seed bank is going to be even more prolific. So it just kind of depends on the site, but generally about year seven. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of questions about how to dispose of uh, invasive species after they've been pulled. Um, you mentioned not composting them. And so uh, one question was, is that in just in home composters or in municipal composters as well? So would you send it out with the uh, yard waste? I'm guessing yeah, not, great but. question. <laughs> um, we never recommend using brown paper bags and there's there's reasons for that. Um, when you're solarizing, you're getting the intern, this is um, based on studies that have been done. If you're using a brown paper bag, we know that the black um, component of a black construction grade garbage bag is what helps get it that internal temperature needed to kill off plants. For every single plant, it's gonna be different. If you're removing buckthorn, something with a really deep tap root, um, and you're bagging it and doing that, um, if you're not burning it, you're gonna need a higher temperature for solarization than say um, garlic mustard, which has a little bit of a smaller, a lot smaller taproot um, and has the ability to be a little bit more vegetative. So the kind of general answer is, it's never recommended to use brown um, yard waste bags as a general rule. And it's just because internally, it's not going to get a high enough temperature to actually solarize. If you're then sending it off to a municipal compost, there can be creep and expansion there in those areas. 
So it's always just the best bet and a rule of thumb to use flat construction grade garbage bags one week in the sun. If it's just particularly cloudy or in the fall where we're not having direct sunlight all the time, keep it for two weeks on a hard and permeable surface so that the internal temperature can reach high enough that those plants will die off and, and cook essentially from the inside. So as a general rule of thumb, I would, I would strongly avoid using uh, paper bags for that reason. It's, if, even if it's out of sight, there could be issues on the other end. Um, and it's always important to reach out to your local landfill as well. If you're, if you're disposing of something that, um, that you think would need to be burned, there's some, there's some areas where the landfill can help you with that. They can do um, municipal burn sites or, or things like that. So it's always important to reach out to your, to your landfill to see what they do and don't accept. Because for example, we've run into issues where they don't accept black construction grade garbage bags. So it's important to know kind of what the rules are for your area as well. Okay, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, other popular invasives such as Phragmites and dog strangling vines. So um, we're wondering if you could just touch on those quickly um, and, and certainly point to more resources about them. Yeah, definitely. So um, for dog strangling vine and invasive Phragmites, because there is native Phragmites as well, less popular um, and, and very uncommon in southern kind of Carolinian zone area, but um, as you move north, we have quite a big population of native Phragmites, so it's important to, um, it's a whole other bag of worms, but making sure how to identify between the two. Um, but as far as invasive dog strangling vine, there's two species. There's uh, black swallower and European or pale swallower, and both of these species are invasive. It's one that can be managed manually as well. Um, I won't get into the management techniques because there's some really great resources that we produce um, with partners at Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Ontario government that really shows um, nicely how to manage it. It's a bit tricky, so um, I won't get into the management of that, but just to say that on the website, it is a, there is a dog strangling vine page where you can go and learn more about management for that. It's one that we are commonly working with people to manage. Um, it can be a backyard issue all the way to a massive farmyard, uh, a farmer's field issue. So it's one that is probably one of the most prolific growers. It wasn't featured in today's webinar because the management is a little bit more technical and every single site has to be treated very unique. Um, so it's not one that is kind of a catch-all that we can talk about in a more general context. So it's one that I definitely recommend checking out the best management practice for. Um, and then to kind of switch as far as invasive Phragmites, definitely a, a huge issue in Southern Ontario. Um, it's a cosmopolitan species, so it's found invasive on every single continent except Antarctica. So if you're dealing with this, you're, you're not alone by any means. Um, invasive Phragmites, again, is a resource that we have on the website that you can check out, uh, the best management practice. But essentially for manual removal of Phragmites, um, it can be done using um, multiple times over the growing season using a sharpened tape uh, to get under the root. With any invasive plant management, it's important to not disturb the system too much. So you're not digging out any invasive plant um, if you don't have to. And a Phragmites is a great example of that. You're cutting the root system below the ground. And there's a lot of great work being done um, uh, through the Ontario Phragmites Collaborative. Um, where they have a lot of great demonstration videos as well. So I recommend checking out our website, which links to all the resources available for Phragmites management. Um, it's even easier to manage Phragmites over water um, if it's in shallow water. So uh, check out the management practices for that if you're dealing with shoreline invasive Phragmites as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I had a question about um, the current status of Japanese hops and recommendations for the management of this plant in the Grand River floodplain. It's a bit more specific, but at least if you were able to provide some information about that. Yeah, Japanese hops is not one of the species that we actively deal with at the Invasive Species Center, so I'm not the, the best person to talk about it with, but I would send my recommendation to reach out to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. We have a great um, office here in Ontario. And they're uh, probably the best person to talk about, especially when it's um, plant and plant pest related. Um, I know that they're doing some work with Japanese hops, so I definitely recommend reaching out to them. I wouldn't speak to it myself because it's not one that we're actively doing management or um, outreach on currently, but every single year that changes, of course. Um, so definitely reach out um, to that uh, uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Okay, 
Okay, great, thank you. Uh, some advice about removing buckthorn. Um, this person writes, the tree trunks are up to six inches in circumference and cutting them down does not kill them. Yes, so, very good. Please Yeah, help. excellent. Yeah, so and buckthorn is a very tricky uh, species to manage as well. It's the, I would say maybe my least favorite invasive species is Japanese knotweed um, and maybe the most hard, but I think that buckthorn is, comes in there pretty high as well. So when we say buckthorn, there's actually um, three different types. There's sea buckthorn, common buckthorn, or European buckthorn, um, and glossy buckthorn. So management will vary um, a little bit depending on what species it is. But typically for uh, buckthorn management, um, there's a tool that you can purchase, and it's a lifesaver if you're doing active management for buckthorn, and it's called, uh, this is actually a brand, but there's a lot of different types you can use, but it, the one that we commonly purchase for our toolkits is called an extractigator. Um, and so it, well, basically what it does is it, it grips onto the bottom of the buckthorn, and you use your weight at a fulcrum to pull the root system out, because it's got a very deep taproot, as anyone that's managing it will know. And this is a really great tool. So I, I really recommend Googling Extractigator. <laughs> um, and you'll find this tool that's available and it's made for pulling out shrubs and small trees. Um, and it's one that we have in our toolkit for invasive uh, buckthorn management and definitely worthwhile. There's also management techniques um, for stump painting. So it's a herbicide application, but it's not one that we would actively um, recommend for public because of course the Pesticides Act and there's a lot of limitations there. So check out Extractigator if you're interested in managing buckthorn. We also, uh, not to keep pushing the website, but we have a great buckthorn page on our website that has the, all the resources and the best management practice for that species as well. Great, thank you. So an interesting question, uh, back to manual removal of different species, um, depending on what they are, uh, different times of year before they see, set seed and all that. But also, um, could you talk a little bit about times of year that should be avoided with respect to, say, avoiding uh, disrupting uh, bee life cycles and if um, wildlife are using the plants. So is there a general sort of guidance that you have about the time of year that is best to remove uh, these invasive species? Yeah, great question. Uh, as far as kind of casting a general net over when to manage invasive plants, many invasive plants are spread by seed. Not all, but many of them are. Many of the species that we deal with are spread, especially garden kind of invasives in general. So Typically our rule of thumb is to always manage the plant before it goes to seed, but it's important to not manage it too early because if you were to pull garlic mustard or to clip garlic mustard, um, which isn't the recommended method, but if you were to pull garlic mustard really, really early in the spring, right when it's forming, it will just reestablish that root system, especially easily if you don't, um, if you leave any fragment of that root system, it will just reestablish from that and then grow throughout the growing season. So it's a really kind of a sweet spot of management. And the best part about the technical uh, management bulletins that are on the website is they're Ontario specific. So they deal with Ontario timelines, which not all, if you were to look at a management practice from uh, Texas, it would be much different than of course um, in Ontario. So the best part about those guides is they do have time of year and application, um, when should you be manually removing time of year. But in general, the rule of thumb is you wanna make sure that you're removing it typically in the spring because that's where you're going to have the plant has established itself and started growth that's how you're able to identify it and then you're removing it before it can set seed stopping it from setting seed for most invasive plants is the most important part the second being proper disposal because if the plant uh, grows by fragmentation as well um, a lot of plants kind of have a, a lot of different um, tools in their toolkit to spread um, so if you're actually trying to manage and, and that first step is just making sure that you're pulling before seed if your species spreads by seed. If I could give kind of a general wide net of, of when it would be typically May, May, mid, uh, early June, but that's, that's um, kind of general. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have about uh, just a few minutes left and so we're gonna get through a few more questions. Um, one, additional follow-up about Himalayan balsam actually on um, as uh, 
you know, on the shoreline or by uh, stream banks, and you're saying that that's a very popular place for it to establish. What are some alternatives for that area that you could recommend instead of letting Himalayan balsam go crazy? Yeah, great question. It, it really depends on the specifics of that area. If you go and check out the Gromian Stead Guides that I mentioned, you'll be able to see for Southern Ontario specifically. So a lot of the time I work in kind of Northern Ontario, which has a, an entirely separate guide uh, for Gromi instead based on zone. So if you check out that guide, not just for Himalayan balsam, but for any species um, invasive in Southern Ontario that you're interested in, um, that's a common garden invasive is gonna be in that booklet. They just added 40 more new um, invasive species and native alternatives. So I recommend going to check that out because it has a great list of species for Himalayan balsam, but also any other garden invasive pest that you're concerned about. It'll give you the alternative specifically based on your um, characteristics and what you're trying to achieve by replanting. So bank stabilization would be different than if you were looking for a pollinator attractor. So I really recommend um, for every species you're interested in replanting, check out that guide. We have hard copies. If you're interested, just reach out to the center and we can send, but you can also find it digitally on the website um, for any invasive species you're interested in replanting. Um, and one other question here that I'd love to get your input on is if someone is interested in um, organizing a community or neighborhood um, uh, pull of uh, mustard, garlic mustard, for example, how would, uh, how would they go about doing that in the best way? Yeah, great question. This is one that we help with a lot, actually. It's been amazing to see the pickup of garlic mustard poles on an Ontario-wide level. Um, it's a species that can be hand removed, which is great because now, of course we know not all invasive species can. And it's one that with a lot of targeted volunteer outreach, you can really make a difference. We run a lot of different garden uh, uh, garlic mustard poles. Um, we partner with uh, folks here in Sault Ste. Marie, we do Thunder Bay, and then we assist on other poles uh, throughout Ontario. So my, my lead recommendation would be check out the Invasive Species Center website because we have um, a great document that fully outlines everything you need to host a garlic mustard pole. And of course, call on the Invasive Species Center for help. We can help assist you. We've done a lot of polls. Um, it's very minimal. Um, it's it's very minimal effort to coordinate, but really great output. So essentially, if you're getting to the nitty gritty, permits, volunteers, and insurance is what you need. And a lot of the time, people will partner with the Invasive Species Center for help with the permitting and insurance process. So if you were interested in pulling together um, and reaching out on opportunities for large scale, this would be public property um, management plans. I really recommend. Um, reaching out, checking out the website for on the garlic mustard page because it's something that we've helped a lot of groups do and it has really great impact. One day a year, pull all the volunteers we can, we can help with promotion um, and just get the word out that this species can be managed if we kind of all do our part. So it's a really great opportunity to host a stewardship event. So definitely reach out if you're interested and, and utilize the tool. Um, it's, it's just titled how to host a garlic mustard pull and it's a, um, a PDF that I pulled together based on a lot of our experience with hosting. So definitely check out those resources and I'm all for helping out <laughs> to pull garlic mustard. So definitely uh, reach out to the center. Thanks so much, Lauren. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for your fantastic questions and for staying engaged in the conversation. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Lauren, for um, your wonderful presentation again. Um, this webinar, as I mentioned, is uh, being recorded, so we are going to be able to post it later on our website, on the uh, WWF Canada YouTube website again. Uh, so check, check, uh, check it out later this week, early next week. And um, if you're feeling inspired to do some more um, native plant planting in your yard, please do visit us at inthezonegardens.ca, uh, register your garden, and you can get all sorts of information about the native plants that you do want to put into your garden. Um, so because together, you know, we it, it takes effort and we can all work together to help uh, reverse the decline in wildlife and um, grow Canada's biggest wildlife garden for, for our wildlife and uh, for people. So thank you again, everyone, and um, stay tuned for future webinars. We'll be sure to post more information 
um, as you know, we arrange them. And uh, thank you again. Bye-bye.